Since then, they've more than eclipsed the memory of Joy Division, certainly in terms of commercial success, and are now truly a super group. As I said, I spoke to Barney Sumner last week. Everybody's probably said to you already that New Order don't do interviews and everything like that, <laughs> and so they've all, you've probably been answering a lot of questions about that. But what about this Con Can single? I never promised you a rose garden. <laughs> well, uh, my son heard it, actually, and even he thought it was me. Well, he thought it was New Order, I should say. Uh, yeah, I don't like the, the ever promise you a rose garden bit. Yeah, it does, does nothing yeah, up it did, it, Yeah, that it? was my idea, that bit. <laughs> <laughs> but who are they, Con Can? Um, all I know about them is that they're Canadians, and um, by some strange coincidence, they happen to make a record that sounds just like several of our records put together. But um don't bother me, really, you know. Mm. So if they had a disease, it'd be bubonic plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> You've done all right without having to do interviews, without having to play the game over the years. I suppose now there's there's kind of no there's no sort of pose value in a way in not doing it, not talking to the press anymore, because everything you set out to prove in that that respect has been proved. Do you well, still do you still find that people expect you to be like I don't know some kind of Jim Morrison, Bob Dylan type figure? Um, not since we've been doing interviews <laughs> and they found out what we're really like. Um. I don't know. That, I suppose the reason why we've not done interviews is um, I just can't take myself seriously enough, you know. Just because you pick a guitar up don't mean that you've got something more to say than the person, you know, the next person to you. You know, I can't take myself seriously enough. Did, did you ever get frightened, though, by your fans? Because they are, I mean, they, especially like in the Joy Division days and the sort of leftovers of that. I mean, all right, they're into the music and everything, but they used to, I mean, they were really odd. I mean, I'd be frightened of being stuck on the bus with a load of Joy Division and New Order fans. Uh, I don't know, really. Uh, no, they've always been all right to me. They've always been okay to me. A bit drunk sometimes. They tend to get a bit rowdy. Very rowdy. I, I used to always think that the, uh, they're always waxing philosophical about things and the looking into life's grimmest recesses. Um, no, I think the press do. The press tend to, you know. They, they're the ones that give us the uh, hefty treatment. But the fans just tend to understand. And uh, just come for a laugh, really, to the concerts. They like the music, but they come to get out of their heads and uh, bush each other about. <laughs> Which escapes me. Well, what about when you go to America? How do they actually view... Because, I mean, they view people like Dave Pesh Molders and the Thompson Twins as being out of this world being in America. Married, yeah. <laughs> um, they view us as a dance band in America and uh, just all the audience dances at every concert because we're a dance band, really. But um, I don't know. Uh, there's not many people even know about Joy Division in America, I suppose that's quite weird. Um, um, I can't think. <laughs> I have to take the headphones off, it feels weird with them on. It feels like I'm going into a world of my own. As a musician, I've got to be honest to myself and I can't carry on making music like Joy Division if I don't feel that way, otherwise it's... I feel like it's conning people. I'd rather people stop liking us, you know then have them still like you and you're pretending to be into the same sort of thing because I don't even listen to the same sort of music that I did then now, you know in fact I don't think anyone did, does really, I wouldn't have thought so anyway, do you listen to the same sort of music that you did then? No, I mean actually I got a bit frightened, I was listening to all my record collection from around sort of 1978, 77 and you know 79 and a lot of it just sounded so dated and so corny Yeah. No, like the Clash's apart first from, album. Apart from all our records. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, everything sounded so dated and so corny. But it is like being an old hippie, isn't it, in a way? Um, yeah, but I even like some old hippie music, you know. I've got an open mind to music. I don't care who writes it. I think there's too much of that about, and I think that attitude's stifled music I think because of that attitude I'll only listen to what's in or I'll only listen to what's cool I think it's stifled like loads and loads of music and it a lot of groups are scared to experiment with music I mean if you listen now 
there's not much experimental music about to what there was in the the 70s you know no one will try anything out of the ordinary and it's because of two reasons one is groups are just greedy and they want to be come they want to get on top of the pops because then they'll you know all the dollars will start rolling in and they'll get beautiful girlfriends and all this crap and the other one is is that they're too scared to do anything different from the next group for fear of being criticised you know which I think is really bad and it's stifling music well when you talk about Top of the Pops you made your famous Top of the Pops appearance which everyone was raving about as if it was some great rebellious act I just thought you looked really out of it to be honest with oh, you oh then yeah that I am on fine time and now I don't I don't I don't know why everyone was raving about it, but I wasn't really out of it either. You, you were saying that you're viewed very much as a dance band in the States. Now, I suppose until Blue Monday really took off in a big way, you were still, you know, you, were, you belonged to the Goths and the post-Joy Division people alone. I mean, you know, Blue Monday was such a big record, it introduced you to an audience who'd never heard the not, previous... Not in America, actually, because um, that's why we reissued Blue Monday last year. 1988, that is. <laughs> um, because it was never released in America, really. It was released as, like, an import. So there was, like, a few thousand copies got over there. But it was never really released. Because the Americans won't release a single if it's not on an album. Right? They won't. They won't do it. And that's why Blue Monday never came out there. So when Substance came out, Blue Monday was on the album. So then, then they could release it. It's some a weird mentality that escapes me, but I'm sure there's some commercial reason for doing it. At the time when you did Blue Monday, when you very first did it, were you actually surprised at how it took off? I mean, Temptation had started getting you some like Radio One daytime play and everything, hadn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was mega surprised at how it took off, and especially when it came back in the charts again after everyone had come back from Spain. I thought that was really funny. And it was, I was really pleased, actually, to go from, um, to go from the uh, manic music of Joy Division and get across to sort of manic people, like our audience were then, to get across to um, Chicken in the Basket of Heath. Well, it seemed really funny, you know, it seemed really um, bizarre. But it was things, things like that appealed to me. I mean, it has become a dance floor standard in a way, you know, that, that you'll, yeah. you'll hear a lot of different kinds oh, of discos. I don't hear it anymore. I'm <laughs> it's the death of the sodding thing, I tell you. <laughs> That's because you go down the Hacienda, you know. Well, what about... We the don't play at the Hacienda, no way. <laughs> <laughs> On pain of death. Yeah, they always play it if we go... Like, the moment we walk into a club abroad, especially in Brazil, went to Brazil in November, and every club we went in, it was like... Not just Blue Monday, but Bizarre Love Triangle and, like, a half an hour in New Order. And we were going up to them, the DJs, and going, OK, oh, take this off. We've got these acid house sets. Can you play some acid house? And you go, the Brazilian people do not like acid house. They like New Order. And we go, we are our New Order. Please take it off, take it off. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. It was wild. What was that actually like? Because you, you did tour South America, didn't you? Um, we were supposed to. We were supposed to be going to Brazil, which we did. And we were supposed to be going to Argentina. And there was a military coup in Argentina. So we didn't go there. But I didn't really want to go anyway, because I'm a bit of a patriot, me. <laughs> a bit of a patriot. <laughs> right, so does that mean you're going to play a benefit gig on the Falklands for all the troops there, then? Um. No, no, it doesn't. But um, no, that's that that subject's a bit of a subject to go into in length. You can't skirt over it. I don't think you were prepared to fight to the last member of the task force. I was. I was, I was. I was. I was. I nearly signed up. I tell you, I did. <coughs> I did. So infuriated, infuriated about what had happened, and then discovered that you had to get out of bed before twelve o'clock midday kind of put me off a bit. I actually noticed when listening to your album, you know, unlike your other albums, it is very much a kind of pop album, and, and I think that it's, it's the album that bands like the Pet Shop Boys have been trying to make recently. You've actually got it, you've, you've got kind of a good, solid 
quite heavy dance 